Isaiah chapter 8. Then the Lord said to me, Take a large tablet and write on it in common characters, belonging to Mahir Shalal Hashbaz, and I will get reliable witnesses, Uriah the priest and Zechariah the son of Jeberechiah, to attest for me. And I went to the prophetess, and she conceived and bore a son. Then the Lord said to me, Call his name Maheshalal Hashbaz, for before the boy knows how to cry, my father or my mother, the wealth of Damascus and the spoil of Samaria will be carried away before the king of Assyria. The Lord spoke to me again. Because this people have refused the waters of Shiloh that flow gently and rejoice over Rezin and the son of Remaliah, therefore, behold, the Lord is bringing up against them the waters of the river, mighty and many, the king of Assyria and all his glory, and it will rise over all its channels and go over all its banks, and it will sweep on into Judah. It will overflow and pass on, reaching even to the neck, and its outspread wings will fill the breadth of your land, O Emmanuel. Be broken, you peoples, and be shattered. Give ear, all you far countries. Strap on your armor and be shattered. Strap on your armor and be shattered. Take counsel together, but it will come to nothing. Speak a word, but it will not stand, for God is with us. For the Lord spoke thus to me with his strong hand upon me, and warned me not to walk in the way of this people, saying, Do not call conspiracy all that this people calls conspiracy, and do not fear what they fear, nor be in dread. But the Lord of hosts, him you shall honor as holy. Let him be your fear. Let him be your dread. And he will become a sanctuary and a stone of offense and a rock of stumbling to both houses of Israel, a trap and a snare to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And many shall stumble on it. They shall fall and be broken. They shall be snared and taken. Bind up the testimony. Seal the teaching among my disciples. I will wait for the Lord who is hiding his face from the house of Jacob, and I will hope in him. Behold, I and the children whom the Lord has given me are signs and portents in Israel from the Lord of hosts who dwells on Mount Zion. And when they say to you, inquire of the mediums and the necromancers who chirp and mutter, should not a people inquire of their God? Should they, should they inquire of the dead on behalf of the living? to the teaching and to the testimony. If they will not speak according to this word, it's because they have no dawn. They will pass through the land, greatly distressed and hungry. And when they're hungry, they'll be enraged and will speak contemptuously against their king and their God and turn their faces upward. And they will look to the earth, but behold, distress and darkness, the gloom of anguish, and they will be thrust into thick darkness. But there will be no gloom for her who was in anguish. In the former time, he brought into contempt the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. But in the latter time, he has made glorious the way of the sea, the land beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the nations. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness, on them has light shone. You have multiplied the nation. You have increased its joy. They rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest, as they are glad when they divide the spoil. For the yoke of his burden, the staff for his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor, you have broken as on the day of Midian. For every boot of the tramping warrior in battle tumult and every garment rolled in blood will be burned as fuel for the fire. For to us, a child is born. To us, a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. The zeal 
of the Lord of hosts will do this. Thanks, Meg. You uh, read that so well, and it's awesome to have that read. It's a big reading. Uh, we're going to dig into that in a moment, but how good it is to see you. How good it is to see you. And I, it may not be mutual, you didn't look like it was, but, but for me, it is good to see you in this place. And as, as we come to God's Word, um, I want us to pray because we, we don't just gather physically because that's what we do. We gather physically because we are God's family purchased by the gift of the Lord Jesus. And whether we're feeling great right now or whether we're not, whatever emotions we come with into this place, we've come to meet the living God. We've come to bow the knees of our hearts before him, and we're going to do that. And we're going to pray that we would experience, we'd meet with the living God tonight. Let me pray, and please pray with me. Father God, as we gather in this place, we submit ourselves before your authority. You are real. You have given your word, not just words on a page written thousands of years ago, but life-giving words of truth and of power. And tonight, Lord, as we gather, we look up to you. We pray, Lord, that you would speak into our experience, you would speak into our lives, wherever we are at in this moment, that we would encounter the living God and that we would be changed. And only you can do this. So we ask that you would now, in the power of the Holy Spirit, and in the name of the Lord Jesus. And God's people said, Amen. Amen. Well, in 2006, I had a, uh, a shave with death, actually. I had a little nick on my right elbow. It was just a tiny little scratch, and I was surfing in the ocean, and somehow or other, a weird marine bug came to live inside my body. And this bug was not a friendly bug. I had um, terrible fevers, I ended up delirious. Uh, I had what's called septicemia. And it resulted in me eventually being rushed into hospital for emergency surgery. Now, it was all pretty vague, but I remember vividly as I was going out for the count before the general anesthetic, hearing the surgeon say, I think we'll be able to save his arm. The next thing, uh, when I woke up groggy, uh, the surgeon came uh, to speak to me and he said, I've got some bad news and I've got some good news. He said, the bad news is you're still very sick. You're going to have to have another week in hospital and you're not going to be able to use your arm for at least six weeks. But he said, the good news you probably already know and I figured part of that. We're going to be able to save your arm and you should gain full use of it. But he said, whether what I'm telling you is good news or bad news, it actually depends on what you do. Because if you change your bandages daily, if you take the antibiotics I prescribe you, then you should gain full use of your arm. If you don't, your arm will not recover. You will never gain full use of it again. He said, there's bad news or good news, but how, what it is for you personally is up to you right now. And this evening, as we come to this text of these two chapters of Isaiah, there's some similarities. You heard read, and we're going to look at together some bad news. But then we're going to see and, exp- and hear of some good news. But what matters to us tonight and what will determine whether that is good news or bad news ultimately for us is how you, how I respond. So bad news, good news, and our present response. So let's start with the bad news. Although as chapter 8 begins, it kind of looks like it might be good news. It begins in verse 1. And uh, if you were... Well, you weren't here physically, but if you were here digitally last week as we looked at Isaiah chapter 7, you remember what the context of chapter 8 is. Uh, King Ahaz is the king of Judah, which is the southern kingdom, and he's got a massive problem because the two kings to the north of him, the king of Samaria and the king of Damascus, have come up to an alliance, and they're coming to smash him. And he and his people are terrified And in chapter 7, God in his grace and mercy sends the prophet Isaiah to him. And he says, come down, be still, trust in me, it'll be okay. But Ahaz can't trust God with something as big as that. He, He leans on diplomacy, he leans on his military strategy. And what he does is he strips his land of gold and silver and he sends it further north 
to the king of the new superpower of the ancient Near East, Assyria, and he says, come and help me against these two nasty bullies to the north of me. And as we open now in chapter 1, sorry, in verse 1 of chapter 8, Isaiah the prophet is told to write on a scroll, Mahashala Hashbaz, which if you didn't know, is what you say if you live in Baghdad and you hit your thumb with the hammer. No, that's not true. Sorry, my, no offense to anyone who does speak Arabic, but it just sounds like an Arabic swear word to me, Mahashala Hashbaz. But it, it actually means swift to the plunder, swift to the spoil. And there's this weird situation where, where Isaiah is told, go to your wife, the prophetess, and from that union will come a little child. And before this child is old enough to go, dad, dad, and mum, mum, the great fear that you worry about in the north is going to be gone. Samaria and Damascus, they're going to be wiped out before that little boy is three years old. So it seems initially like it's very good news. The, the northern enemies of the people of God in Judah have, um, and Isaiah talks about it in chapter 8, he says, they, they've forsaken the small flowing waters of Shiloh. Another name for, for Gihon, the spring that feeds Jerusalem. And you can actually, I think we've got a picture of these waters. Has anyone walked through the Gihon spring? I have a couple of times. You have, Matt? Anyone, anyone else? The, the, it's, it's a very, you can, actually, that's the wrong image. Go back one. <laughs> that's it. <laughs> it's a small little flowing stream. And it, you, sometimes it, you don't even notice the water move. It, it takes the water supply from outside Jerusalem into the city. And, um, and, God, through Isaiah, says, look, you've rejected those little water supply, the gentle flowing streams that, that require dependence on God. And instead, you've looked further north and you've looked to the waters of the king of Assyria, which is that second slide. That's the Euphrates River near Baghdad. Can you see the difference? And Isaiah says, because you have asked for that, you, you, that's what you'll get the king of Assyria. But it sounds like good news because the king of Assyria is going to come and destroy these northern kingdoms. But, as is so often the case, when we turn away from something else besides, to, to something else and we turn away from God, the thing we turn to ends up captivating us. It ends up controlling us. It ends up making it its slave. And you can think of money. If you live for that, it'll make you its slave. If you think of your sexuality, you live for that, it'll make you your slave. If you think of your health or your fitness or your attractiveness, all of these things will come to consume you. And in the case of the people of Judah in the southern kingdom, they've gone, we don't want God. We don't want these flowing waters of Shiloh, these little stream. We want to turn to power and diplomacy. We want to turn to the king of Assyria. And God says, well, you're going to get him. You'll get what you wanted, but you won't want what you get. And he goes on to say that it, it's as if the, the people are, are standing at the foot of one of those massive concrete dams and they're looking up and they see the spider cracks start to form. Start to see the first dribbles of water. And you know what's coming next. And that's what happens. The king of Assyria comes. And he doesn't just stop with destroying the northern enemies of Judah before Mahal... Hashbaz is three years old. That happens. He destroys them, but he keeps coming. And he floods over the land of Judah until he destroys all of the cities and fortresses until Jerusalem alone is le left with water up to its neck. And we'll read of that in a couple of weeks, actually. Actually, in Isaiah chapter 36. We'll see what happened. But this is bad news. Bad, bad news. The people have turned away from God and there's darkness and there is judgment. It is a terrible, terrible period, but there's also good news. There is very good news. God's deliverance is coming. And it's a deliverance that we see foreshadowed in chapter 8. You heard those words in verses 9 and 10. Be broken, you peoples, and be shattered. Give ear, all you far countries. Strap on your armor and be shattered. Strap on your armor and be shattered. Take counsel together, but it'll come to nothing. Speak a word, but it will not stand, for God is with us. There's hope, there's good news, it's coming. The, the God's judgment is not his final word, there's, there's hope. And this hope in chapter 9 starts to really get legs. It gets momentum. Listen, it, chapter 9 contains some of the most famous uh, words in 
the whole Bible. And every Christmas, if you've been in a church, you'll know that it's rolled out and with good cause. Because these words are beautiful, they'll be familiar to you. He says, at that time there will be no more gloom for those in distress. In the past, he treated the land of Naphtali and Zebulun with contempt. They were the northernmost tribes of Israel, the very first to be destroyed by Assyria. He said in the past, it was darkness of judgment and contempt. But then he says, but now he will honor Galilee of the Gentiles. Honor will come to Galilee, in which, of course, is the town of Nazareth. He said, those walking in the darkness have seen a great light. Light is good news when you are lost in the dark. The nation is enlarged, he says. It's filled with joy and rejoicing. There's peace and security. The, 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 the warrior's boots soiled with blood gone. This is wonderful. Why? Why? Because he says to us, a child is given. To us, he says, a son is born, not like Mahashallah Hashbaz, a child of judgment, but Emmanuel, God with us, a child of hope. It's good, good news. There'll be a baby who will be born on David's throne, and he will bring about an ear of light. It's good news. And the titles, did you hear the titles that this child will have? This little child will hold these titles, Wonderful Counselor. Mighty God, everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. This is such good news. We see here that the bad news of God's judgment, we see the light of God's promises. But that takes us to the third, final point. What matters is how we respond now. Whether that will be ultimately the best news imaginable for us, or whether it'll be ultimately the worst news imaginable for us. It depends on what we do, what you do, what I do now. So let's look at that. Now, I don't want to detract from the glorious promise that we see at Christmas. This is amazing, wonderful news that Isaiah receives of the coming of light and of hope. But put yourself in Isaiah's shoes. Isaiah did not see it come to its complete fulfillment. Isaiah lived in a time of judgment. If you were here, or you're digitally here a few weeks ago, you'll know that when Isaiah was commissioned and he was sent into the ministry, he was told, you'll preach and no one will listen. You'll preach and all it will do will harden people's hearts. Isaiah was given a message that people would not respond. He lived in dark times. He lived in a time when, when this light that is foreshadowed was 700 years away. And when Isaiah died, he didn't see it. He died a martyr. Church tradition tells us he was sawn in two. Isaiah lived in a time of darkness. He lived in a time when God's people had turned away from God's word. When they'd rejected the waters of Jerusalem in favor of other things that they thought would save them. Now, we live on the other side of Jesus coming. He lived before, we live after, but there are still some similarities, aren't there? Do we not also live in a land that has known the goodness of God? Do we not live in a land that is, is founded in its laws and its structures on, a, on the heritage of God's word recorded in the scriptures? Do not we live in a land that has been blessed extravagantly by God? And do we not live in a land that has turned willfully away? What have we chased after in our land? Well, many things. One of them is obviously prosperity, isn't it? Like on a wasn't so much today, but very often on a morning driving into church, you know, I see the, the guys out on their Lycra on their bikes and, you know, the, the ladies walking the dog and, and I see the cafes that are full. And uh, sometimes after church pre-COVID, I'd, I'd duck to get something in, in that great temple of Bunnings in Warm Ponds and, and I'd look at people bustling and shopping, you know, trolleys filled up with stuff all on the temple of home improvement. And there's nothing wrong with those things. There's nothing wrong with like well, Lycra maybe, but nothing wrong with bike riding. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with cafes. There's nothing wrong with working on your home. Not, no one's sinning by doing that. But the question is, is that, is that all there is? Is that what people live for? And the answer is yes. In many cases, yes. 
there's an, there's an abandonment of God which, which runs into the things that we hunger after. And maybe tonight, they're the things that you hunger after. It may not be home improvement, it may not be comfort, but, but there'll be things that you hunger after which are not God. Maybe it's relationships. Maybe you are after someone who you want to fulfill you, and you're really living for that. Uh, maybe whatever it is, your, your career advancement, whatever is, is driving you. So many people in this nation of Australia, we live for those things and we turn our backs willfully on God who created us. And it's not just at an individual level, it's at a corporate level, it's a, a governmental level. We live in a time of darkness. And if you don't see that, you're kidding yourself or you're blind. This very week in the Victorian Parliament, the Victorian government has tabled legislation which is called gay conversion therapy ban. Now, when I hear that le legislation, I think, initially, I think, that's great. Who, who would want to force someone with electric shocks or something to try and, who, who would want to, to advocate that someone be forcibly shifted and bullied and changed? Not me, and I hope not you. Who wants that? But make no mistake. This legislation is not that innocent. If you look on the government website, it speaks to the fact that, that homosexuality and your, your gender identity are things that you choose for yourself. And if anyone would speak against those, if anyone would try to, to say, no, this is not a good choice for your life, that is, and I quote the website, bigoted quackery. And this is not, this ideology says that if you would do that, well then the sanction you might face is 10 years in jail. There, there is a darkness in our land of a nation that's turned away from God. Think of the last 10 years. What have we seen? We've seen some of the most obscene and terrible abortion laws on the planet. In the last 10 years, we've seen Christian religious education taken out of schools. In the last 10 years, we've seen a euthanasia bill that be can begin the process of devaluing the life of the aged. We live in a time that has darkness. Like Isaiah, we live in a country that has turned away from the truth. Now, there's two sides to this. That's a black picture. There's real darkness in our world today. And if you say, oh, Andrew, you're just exaggerating it. It's not that bad. But did you hear the promises that Isaiah spoke of? Did you hear that about the warrior's boot being thrown away? The warrior's boot coat in blood? Have you followed the news? Have you seen what our own Australian army has been guilty of in Afghanistan? Has that happened yet? No, it hasn't. And, and what about the racial injustice that we see across so much of our world? What about the injustice, the systematic exploitation of women and children? What about the, the exploitation and the oppression of the of the own citizens of governments? Governments oppressing their own people. Don't tell me we live in a world that's full of sunshine and blue sky. We live in a world where the promises given to Isaiah have not yet come into their entire full fulfillment. This is the world we live in. There's injustice. But it's also true that we live on the other side of the coming of Emmanuel, of the coming of Jesus. We live in a world, and if you're a Christian here tonight, you know the reality of this yourself. We live in a world where God has sent his son into our world, which we celebrate at Christmas, and the kingdom of God has come. It's not here fully, but it's come. God has broken into our world. And if you're a Christian, you know he's broken into your heart. He has taken what is dark and filled it with light. He has given us hope. He's given us a future. He's given us the ability to, to reconcile, to forgive. He's given us and filled us with his Holy Spirit. And as you come tonight, if you're a Christian, I trust and pray that you know this for yourself. If you're not yet a Christian, this is open to you. But we still live in a world where there is darkness. And so this is the practical part of tonight. Isaiah just said, what are we going to do? What are you going to do? There's a couple of options, isn't there? We could take up arms against the government. We could, we could form a, a terrorist cell. You smile, but that's what happens in many parts of the world. We could, we could do any number of things. We could just, oh, it doesn't matter, nothing to do with me. I'm apathetic. How should we live in this world where there's the promise of great hope and light, and yet there's darkness? What does our present response look like? Isaiah in chapter 8 tells us. 
And I want to look at two things he says. Firstly, chapter 8, verses 11 to 13. Listen to these again. Listen to this. For the Lord spoke thus to me, with his strong hand upon me, and he warned me not to walk in the way of this people, saying, Do not call conspiracy all that this people calls conspiracy. And do not fear what they fear, nor be in dread. But the Lord of hosts, him you shall honor as holy. Let him be your fear and let him be your dread. Isaiah says, don't fear what they fear. Don't dread it. Now, that's a good question. What do they fear? What do we as Australians fear? I'll give you a couple of things, and, and maybe, maybe you think these are true or not. I think we fear financial collapse. And ironically, I think the older you get, the more you fear it. Because you get used to finances and superannuation providing the security and the comfort that you need. And Australians fear financial collapse that would, would strip us away from being the richest nation on earth and providing the comforts that we want. Australians fear global warming and climate change. We fear coming into a world that is that has become destitute, that its goodness has been exploited. We fear that, that it would remove our ability to enjoy the world that we live in. We fear that. And do we not also fear that the, the cancer that strikes unexpectedly or the car accident that robs us of our ability to enjoy life physically? We fear those things, don't we? But you're saying, Andrew, you're not even close to what we really fear. What do we really fear in 2020? If you don't know this, then I would like to know what alien planet you've lived on because we fear COVID-19, we fear coronavirus, don't we? Don't they? Don't the world? Coronavirus has manufactured more fear than I think nearly anything else I've ever experienced. And now some of you are nervous. But I want to have a go at both of you, both sides. I want to have a go first at the people who think that coronavirus is equivalent to the Black Death. 90% 90% mortality rate or something like that. The people who, who are so afraid of going outside the door because they'll contract coronavirus. The lady I saw this morning walking her dog in the middle of nowhere with a mask on. Now, she, maybe she gets hay fever. But there's a fear that has been manufactured. There's a fear that the government has exploited deliberately. Coronavirus, fear it, fear it. And then on the other hand, you notice the Bible says, don't call conspiracy what they call conspiracy. How many conspiracy theories are there out there? Coronavirus doesn't really exist. It's all a government plot. It's all Now look, <laughs> there might be some of these things. You could catch coronavirus and die, and there could be a real conspiracy. But the words of Isaiah said, don't fear what they fear. Don't dread what they dread. But Isaiah says, you should fear. He says, oh yeah, you should fear. Not what they fear. You should fear something else and you should wake every morning with that fear in your life. You should go out throughout the day aware of that fear. When you close your eyes, that fear should weigh heavy on you. If you wake in the night, you should fear. He says you should fear. And what should you fear? Well, he tells us in verse 13. And in Hebrew, it is literally Yahweh Shavuot. Translated as the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of heaven. Verse 13. He is the one you are to regard as holy. He is the one you are to fear. He is the one you are to dread. If you get corona, what's the worst thing that can happen to you? If you're put in prison by the government, what is the worst thing that can happen to you? What is it? They could kill you? They can destroy this this body that you have given. They could kill it. That's pretty bad, isn't it? No, not really. Your body's going to die anyway. And you say, Andrew, you're really on the Old Testament roll tonight. This is fire and brimstone. Isaiah, you just got in with the rhetoric and it's all fire and brimstone. What about, what about the New Testament? Well, let me quote to you the words of Jesus Christ himself, the one who was meek and mild, Emmanuel, God with us. Listen to what he said, Luke chapter 12, verse 4. I tell you, my friends, do not be afraid of those who kill the body and after that can do no more. I will show you whom you should fear. Fear him 
who after the killing of the body has power to throw you into hell. Yes, he says, you fear him. Jesus says, friends, we are standing at the foot of the dam and we are looking up and there are spider cracks everywhere in that dam. And the first trickles of water are coming and Jesus says, you fear him. Because the only thing that holds back his just, righteous judgment is his mercy. But he says, the spider cracks are there. I've warned you, if you're not yet a Christian, look up and take action. You need to respond. You will respond. You'll do one thing or the other. You you will respond by seeing that and acting or you'll turn away and pretend it doesn't exist. You'll make a response. And that response will decide whether this news is the best news for all eternity or the worst news of all eternity. But you will respond. And Christian, for you and I, we also stand and we see the dam and we see see the cracks and we know that there is a real fear that we're called to for God Almighty and the reality is so many of us don't fear God at all. God's my mate. God's my co-opter in achieving whatever I want from my little world, which I dominate and I control. God is the one that I call into my plans or I reach out when I'm in a desperate moment. And so many of us, we sit on the fringes of the church, and maybe that's you tonight. You'd say you're a Christian, but you don't really know what it is to have the Holy Spirit living in your heart. And the old adage that says, well, what if Jesus came tonight? What if Jesus Emmanuel stood here tonight? Would you be ready? And you think in your heart, Well, if that's you, you can see the spider cracks too. You you need to come and you need to respond. That's why this warning is given. The bad news is given so that you might embrace the good news. Christianity, again, I say this over and over. It's not something on the fringes of your life. Fearing God when you understand who he is and who you are, it's all of you. Whether you're an old person or a young person, whether your life is ahead of you or it's coming to an end, God's call for you in Jesus Christ is to respond to him with everything you have. There is no other response. And and Christians, I'll speak to us now, brothers and sisters, to the extent that you become one of these people that fear COVID-19, to the extent that you become one of these conspiracy theorists, you dishonor God. You live as if he's not there. Now, hear me. This is important. I am not saying that any of these things that people fear and that maybe you fear, I'm not saying that we should do nothing about them, right? I'm not saying that we should do nothing about climate change. I'm not saying that we should ignore COVID-19 and pretend it's not there. I'm not saying that, that, that we should, in any of these ways, because that is not wisdom. The books of Isaiah, uh, the books of Ecclesiastes and Proverbs, among others, Speak to us about how to live wisely in the world. These are real things. So we should respond with wisdom and a considered action. I, I, I hope you see that we're doing that tonight in regard to COVID-19. We're wanting to respond in a way that is wise and considered. This week, I'm going to be writing letters to my MP about this new legislation. I hope you will too. That is not fearing that is taking wise and considered action. They're very different. But Christians, to the extent that we fear God, to the extent that that we're ambassadors of Jesus Christ, we're designed to be like candles, a light in the dark room, that people outside will look at us and go, that's what it is to know the living God. And brothers and sisters, to the extent that we fear the same things as the world, we dishonor God. That's no no small thing. We might say we fear him, but we don't. Ray Ortland is a uh, commentator. He writes this. It's true. He says that we're not to respond to life in a way that makes God look helpless and weak and worthless. Living emotionally as if God were not really our savior is practical atheism. If you fear the same things as everyone else, you dread the same things as everybody else, you let that dominate you, you're living as a practical atheist. A Christian man or a Christian woman should fear God and fear nothing else. Now, point two, wait, wait for the Lord. Verse 17, Isaiah says, I will wait for the Lord who is hiding his face from the house of Jacob and I will hope in him. 
Isaiah says, I live in a time when it feels like God's hiding his face. He's hiding his face from his people. Where is he in my suffering? Where is he in my difficulty? Where is he? And Isaiah says, you know what I do while I wait between the bad news of God's judgment and the good news of his salvation? Where do I wait in that middle? He says, I wait by looking to God. I focus on him. Even if he's hiding his face, I'll focus on him. Others like King Ahaz will put their trust in power or politics or things they can touch and see and feel. Others, again, it says in verse 19, will consult mediums, the occult, the star signs, um, the the latest whatever it will be, self-help books, the latest fad. These things are not for the Christian. Christians are to wait on the Lord, to look to Him, to trust Him. Are you waiting on the Lord as you you wait in that in-between time? Are you really waiting on Him? What does it mean to wait on Him? It means to to put your trust in him, to depend on him. And how do you know what he wants from you? How do you know how you should live? Well, God gives us the answer in verse 20. He says this, Isaiah, to the law and the testimony. The law and the testimony. If they do not speak according to this world word, they have no light. The law and the testimony. What's the law and the testimony? It's the Bible. How do you know how to live? You know how to live because God has given you his revelation in his word. You are not left to wander around in the dark. He has told you how you should live. He has told you whom you should fear and he's told you what that fear looks like and you have access to that every day of your life. As a church, when you come together, you will hear the Bible be the centerpiece of who we are. It's the only soil that can sustain a living, vibrant church. It's the word of God the law and the testimony. And Isaiah says, to the extent that someone speaks and they don't speak according to that word, they have no light. You can meet people, you will hear people, maybe you will even even encounter or know people who wear big titles like bishop or archbishop or senior lecturer. Let me warn you, if they do not speak according to the law and the testimony, they have no light. But they sound so nice and so reasonable and what they say fits in with what culture would say and and it's going to be much more popular to believe what they believe. Here, Isaiah, they have no light. And to the extent that you and I believe them, we show that we actually don't fear God at all. What is it to fear God? It means to trust in His Word, to look to Him even when He seems to hide His face but to trust and commit to his word, the Bible. Do you see now, as I'm going to ask the, ask the band up, we're going to continue on by looking to this same God, by spending time in his presence in communion. But do you see why I said there's a similarity between this passage and the surgeon? He said to me, there's bad news, but there's good news. And how that news really becomes true for you Whether it's good or bad news depends on how you respond now. Isaiah looked ahead to the coming of Emmanuel, to the coming of the Lord Jesus. We look back. He's here. And tonight, as as I close, I want to encourage us that, that if you are not yet a Christian, one more time, please look up to the dam, see the cracks, and take action. Come to him while you can. And if you are a Christian, but your life is consumed by fears, that you really, you're indistinguishable from, you dread the same things as everybody else, you fear the same things as everybody else, then tonight, look to the dam and find something to fear, because there is something to fear. There is someone to fear. Someone who is worth fearing, even when this physical body is gone, who has the power to throw us into hell. Fear him. So tonight, as as we close, do you fear him? Are you waiting for him? Even if he's hiding his face, are you pressing into him? Do you trust in his word? Are you ready when Emmanuel, God with us, will come the second time, not as the baby in the major, but as Yahweh Shavuot, the Lord of the armies of the gods of heaven? Yeah, I tell you. Fear him. Let's pray.
to this holy, righteous God. Father God, we come to you tonight and, oh Lord, we don't fear you. We're just like everyone else so often, aren't we? we we're blown by the winds, we go here and there. We want what they want, we fear what they fear. Oh Lord, forgive us. Remind us again tonight of who you are, of your majesty, your holiness. Remind us that, that the bad news of your judgment is mixed by the good news of your salvation. And that, Lord, you don't want anyone to perish, but everyone to come in faith. And, Lord, we, we pray tonight for, for those that are listening or, or here tonight who don't know you yet. Lord, may they see those spider cracks. And may they respond before it is too late. May they not be like Ahaz so long ago who was offered every grace and refused to listen. And, Father, for us, we pray that you would give us the strength to fear nothing except you. Lord, help us to, to know that, that all people may hate us because of your name. That they may revile us and say all sorts of things of evil about us. Help us to, to hear and to know that they may call us before judges and that they may bring us before tribunals, but we're not to worry because you'll give us the words and that though brother turn against brother and father against child and child against parent, yet you are Emmanuel. And yet, as we fear you, we need fear nothing else because you will never let those go whom you have purchased by the blood of the Lord Jesus, our Savior. So tonight, Lord, as, as, we, as we share communion, as we, we worship tonight, we pray, Lord, that you'd meet with us, that we leave tonight more aware of who you are, fearing you, not as, not as fearing a bully or, a, or a, a, some sort of dominating, horrible character, but fearing you for your beauty and living in awe and submission at your presence. Lord, would you, as we prayed, meet with us again tonight? Would, as you forgive us, would you establish us? Would you make us truly Emmanuel's own? God with us, Jesus. Would you make us his in deed as well as in belief? And we ask it in his precious name. Amen.